Okay, well, welcome everybody. Welcome back. Nobody left. Um, my name is Carlos Centeno. I'm with the uh, MIT GovLab, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Governance Lab. Um, we do research on bureaucracies and bureaucrats and try to understand how innovation works and sometimes doesn't work inside government, <laughs> especially looking at the relationship between uh, citizens and government. Um, I'm very thrilled to have uh, this panel today here because we're going to be talking about some things that you might not have heard about throughout the, the rest of the day. Um, I have the honor to introduce a special advisor to the President of Nigeria on doing business, ease of doing business, Dr. Jimoke Oduwole. Thank you. As well as Roman Yosif, uh, former executive director and founder or co-founder of the um, Laboratorio de Gobierno, Government Laboratory of Chile, which uh, We've done some internal research ourselves in our lab and found out that it's probably the most successful innovation lab in the Global South. Um, and so we're eager to learn from, uh, from Roman's experience who went through the whole thing and is finally taking a break. So, <laughs> um, so the, the, I think the first thing that pops into my mind uh, for everybody to get situated of where you work and how you work, of the immense challenges that you face. And, and these are very different challenges, you know. Um, in Nigeria, you have uh, everything from infrastructure challenges, power cuts, um, uptake of technology, um, a large bureaucracy. In Chile, you, you just went through a reinvention of your country, in a way. Uh, biggest social upheaval, violent protests in uh, a few years ago. And uh, now you went through a whole uh, consultative process. Tell us a little bit about what the challenges are in uh, innovating in this context. And, and I know this is the GovTech Summit, but we're going to take it a little bit back and uh, talk about designing, and then we'll talk about tech. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Jamoke. What is, it, what is it like working in, in your context? Well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, over 200 million people. 70% um, of the population is under 30. Over 40% under 15, so a very young population. Um, just under 50% of the uh, economy, the GDP, is powered by small and medium-sized enterprises, mostly micro. So business climate reforms becomes really important in a situation like that. So powered by SMEs, mm -hmm. and um, that you also mean startups. <coughs> and yes. Yeah. Uh, and so your role in, uh, it's, it's called PEBEC, it's the Presidential Enabling Business Council, yes. is... Um, to work in this context and uh, maybe uh, uplift, enable the business community to be part of this change, right? Yes, a systemic change, uh, removing um, bureaucratic bottlenecks and legislative bottlenecks, just making sure that it's easier, faster, more transparent to do business, and we focus on people issues, processes, and to a lesser extent, infrastructure. And um, to, um, from your perspective of the, the last, what, six years? Mm -hmm. um, um, of what you've seen starting, uh, um, I was going to say bootstrapped, uh, to put together this team and, and um, find the talent in the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. What has been um, your biggest continuous challenge so far? Um, buying of our internal audience um, within government, the public and civil servants, keeping them focused and consistent on the pain of reform and change. Also, the trust deficit with private sector, especially when reforms unravel, that's also um, quite difficult. Mm. So we have to constantly put our foot on the accelerator, check everything, make sure that implementation is ongoing. Iterative process of funnel down to really uh, listen to the users. So a lot of stakeholder engagement and strategic communication. You mentioned a couple of things that uh, I'm really keen to ask Roman. One is trust, uh, and the other one is engaging the public. So talk about uh, um, designing for, for, for citizens. Um, what's your experience with the challenges in Chile now that the citizens are not very much trusting the government? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be here uh, having some interesting conversations related on how government must be run and how in the 21st century, how the public policy must be a, a policy uh, that is user-centered in 
all the areas uh, that we can manage, of course, uh, from the government. And in, in my own experience in Chile, Chile, I, I don't know if you, if you know about Chile, it's a very long country in the South America. I will say it's a middle income country. In the last 30 years, we advanced a lot in terms of uh, decreasing poverty, in terms of international um, uh, agreements, uh, in terms of commercial uh, agreements. But uh, in 2019, we had a very surprising social outbreak uh, in the middle of the last government. And me and my team, we were in the middle of a evolving process of what we understood was public sector innovation, which kind of methodologies um, can be operated in a real um, situation in healthcare, in housing, in taxes policies, in how you deliver faster and more user-friendly the social benefits. So in all this crisis, to, to have the opportunity to, to reinvent a government lab was uh, very exciting and very challenging because the challenges in Chile right now are related to recovery trust between citizens and the government and in general all kind of state agencies. And to do that, we understood in the lab that innovation can be a very useful tool, for example, to uh, deliver more than one million uh, employment subsidies uh, in a few months and design and implement a new platform, an interoperate platform to coordinate 10 different agencies to do that in a very friendly way to SMEs uh, using data that government has to deliver uh, better services, understanding that digital transformation is not to take a non-digital process and then have it in a website, to really understand how to transform the process that government runs in a way that the, um, the user is better uh, interpreted and also in many other areas. And, and I will say that the main issue, the main challenge is how to reconnect citizens with government throughout innovation processes that for one side, you can solve a real and concrete problem. And for the other side, you are co-creating with people that legitimize more what government is doing. You mentioned um, uh, innovation as a way or a vehicle for trust. I, I really uh, I like that. But also, um, in terms of what you were talking about, delivering the subsidies to a million people, is efficiency tied to trust in the context that you work in? I mean, I have the same question for Dr. Jamoki. Absolutely, because if you think, if you think what government does is deliver services to people in different areas. So if you are delivering wrong, of course, people are angry. And we are in a world that we take our cell phone, we ask, in Uber Eats uh, and hamburger, and the hamburger gets in 30 minutes. Why the government must work uh, in a different way? Mm. Uh, we as uh, civil servants, or we, if you are working in a startup related with government, we must understand that uh, government uh, had an um, ethical uh, challenge related to really deliver in a good way, in an efficient way, the services. So when you improve that, you are doing efficiency, of course. You are doing better with the same resources. But also, you are reconnecting citizens that receive a better services. They, are, uh, they in improve their quality of life. And also, this 
impact directly, and we measure this with several experiments, and then we escalate them, for example, with a, a, trans, a transparency report that we, uh, in the beginning on the, of the pandemic, we transparent all the expenditures of the government in a user-friendly uh, way. We prototype this with more than 500 people along the country in the 16 different regions with the civil servants, um, installing them new capabilities to co-create, to co-design, to understand how data can be uh, transparent in a very simple way. And right now, three years later, every single Chilean receive yearly the report of taxes on how your taxes, your specific amount that you contribute to the country is used by the government in the different mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. And that impacts a lot the 50% uh, 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 of improvement of confidence only because of that intervention, mm -hmm. very concrete intervention, digital, very easy to do it. And the main idea uh, beside this was how to improve the transparency and how the transparency impact the confidence. That's super interesting. And, and, and Dr. Jumoke, I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask you the, the question in a different way. Okay. Though. <laughs> You're dealing with the, the private sector, with the business mm -hmm. community, um, not so as much uh, um, on the public sector as Roman, but which brings up an interesting question. So the private sector is the bottom line. It is efficiency and delivery to the customer. If they're not delivering to the customer, they're going to go to the competitor. Yes. You're at the intersection of private sector, government. Mm -hmm. Tell us about efficiency and trust and transparency. Um, it's at the hallmark of the social contract in the sense that when we started this program and we looked at what does private sector really need from government, there's bureaucracy, there's corruption. So you need efficiency and transparency. And that was what led us to the first executive order, executive order one, just looking at efficiency and transparency of public service delivery and simple methodology and then just rating all the about 55 MDAs that have interface with the public. When you're able to, to track um, the transparency in the processes, uh, who's accountable, who's responsible, the exact officer who interfaces with business people, then you can isolate pain points and address them. So for private sector, having written off government and what Roman was saying, um, how people are more willing to pay their taxes when there's accountability. When the private sector can see that there's effort to be more efficient, to be more transparent, first of all, the actual process, before even automating or laying any digitization on it, making sure that the processes are reduced, the people issues, so a lot of stakeholder engagement, a lot of focus group sessions, trying to distill exactly where the shoe is pinching with private sector. And so having a transformation unit and uh, a, a team that is dedicated to doing this has earned us a lot of uh, credibility and trust. And now we're coming to tech. Um, Roman, you mentioned this. Uh, I want to stay with, with you, Dr. Jumoke, okay. and then you go to Roman. Tech, or in, you said innovation, but let's go to tech. Tech as a vehicle for transparency. And uh, we've talked about this before. Tell us a little bit about your experience with that and um, innovating in that space. It's a shortcut. Um, it tackles both things, the transparency and the efficiency. So with tech, you can make sure that access to paying your taxes, um, once it's automated, the filing and the payment, that was one reform we were able to do. Um, incorporating business, reservation of business names, that was another automation project we were able to do. Uh, visas on arrival, very popular with the business community, so you can get your uh, investors or partners to come into the country for take our electronic visa. So with tech, we were able to really capture the attention and imagination of private sector, and it works. It's empirical, you can track how well it's working, how well it isn't, so it's always the best shortcut. But of course, the processes first have to be efficient before you layer tech on them. And the, and the thing with putting tech in some of these processes is you're cutting out this, um, let's call them informal 
benefactors. <laughs> the human interface, right. the problem, the, the rent-seeking opportunities. My boss is always like, why this euphemism? So the corruption, the elephant in the room, um, that officer that has the opportunity to ask you for something or to help you out, mm. if you're doing it from your office online, yeah. Is that, uh, can you, does that resonate with you? I, I will complement Dr. Jumoke that, of course, take it like an, ab an habilitator for create new services to improve the, the current services of any kind of government, local government and national government. But at the end of the day, in, in, in our experience in Chile, the most important challenge is not the technical challenge is the management and political challenge. And why is that? We talked a lot about this yesterday. Is because when you are uh, fostering any kind of transformation in big organization like governments, but can be also a big international company, you are dealing with a lot of people, with a lot of interests, so you, can, you must manage new incentives in a way that people will move from the comfort zone to the new uh, way of doing. Uh, and for example, we, we did this also in the pandemic with the Ministry of uh, Women Affairs in Chile. We understood at the beginning of the pandemic that uh, we had a huge problem related to violence uh, inside uh, the families, because of the um, of the um, how do you say in English like el, uh, the confinement, confinement, the, the no, 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 the lockdown, the lockdown. Yeah. Thank you. She speaks Spanish. You, doctor. Now I found <laughs> the lockdown <laughs> because of the lockdown uh, in in I think in, in every country the violence uh, against women increased a lot. So we detect that with the Ministry of Women Affairs, and we co-create with women associations, with civil servants of that ministry and other NGOs, which kind of service will be better to understood women need. And we realized that we had the technology and was WhatsApp, because we needed a silent channel to connect these women with the uh, state agencies to protect them, of course, and to deliver different kind of services. And we collaborate with Facebook, the owners of WhatsApp, and we install and we co-create with them a special service, digital service, um, above the uh, WhatsApp business API. And this is a good example and is still running because it's a good services, um, it's, it's a good service also uh, right now because uh, it's very user-centered because women needs a silent way to communicate, not a call center and say, hello, I'm with the, uh, my husband and he's being violent with me in a louder way. So at that moment, you understand that innovation can be very simple, can use a, a um, massive technology like WhatsApp, and you only need to design and then, of course, implement a new service using current technology, but the incentives inside the public sector must be aligned to then operate well this new channel inside the ministry. So if the politician didn't understood that, or if the lab didn't sell well the idea based on evidence, based on the user need, you cannot implement anything. So the technical issues, of course, are important, but are not the most important thing when you are talking on public sector innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were talking uh, yesterday, Dr. Jamoke, exactly about um, what it takes to bring in the senior leadership to buy into something, some of solutions like what Roman was explaining, which might even be hard to sell. You have to work with Facebook and, uh, and such sensitive uh, affairs. 
in your sector, which works a lot with private sector, how do you manage to bring on the leadership to work for the benefit of private sector, for society? Well, the, the, the first thing, and I agree with Roman and what he said about technology, the first thing is really to do your stakeholder mapping and where's the influence, um, who needs to do what. So depending on the type of reform, um, then you start cultivating the enlightened self-interest and you know, gaining momentum. You have to have different layers of communication. So we have our internal stakeholders. Those are the government people. If you're dealing at the highest levels, you need your political support from the presidency, the ministers, the heads of agencies, but you also have to go very granular. So my team is here, you know about, about nine of them are here with me. And we have to really, if it's a seaport, we're going on field trips, we're going to the airports, we're going to actually the um, agencies and seeing how they work and engaging with them, getting to know them as people. To be able to deliver for private sector, you have to listen very carefully. So we had this tour we did once, the lituation, listen, implement, track. We went all across the country a number of times, speaking with our target audience, um, young entrepreneurs for reasons why I told you, I explained the demographic of the country. And when you listen, you have the trust and you're implementing specific reforms. While change isn't necessarily native to public and civil servants, there are ways that you can convince them um, that this is in their best interest. And we're a support team, so we give out the credit very freely. Uh, collaboration is very important across all arms and levels of government. And um, collaboration works. It does work. We've seen it with private sector, with state governments, uh, with the National Assembly. We've passed about four legislations. Um, so that's really the key. And also the key to sustainability, because I know you're going there. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually, we, don't, we only have five minutes left, but I, I wanted to ask you about visiting the ports must be an amazing experience in Nigeria specifically. You need to um, come. Maybe take one, one minute to talk about that and we'll go to, um, if you have questions, go to Slido and post them here. I don't think it's been refreshed. It's probably one of our toughest reforms and our, our example of failing forward because we really haven't accomplished some of the big infrastructure things like a single window that we'd like to put in. And I think that learning, it's been six and a half years now, we try to tackle it first. So this is 2016, 2017. The system completely ran circles around us. With hindsight, we've learned so much. Uh, we've known how to build collaboration and influence. So if we're tackling it now, we know a lot better what to do yeah, and how to get results. And. Uh, well, it's been six years. Ten years. For you, it's been uh, eight, nine years? Eight. Years. Eight years. One thing that Dr. Shimoka mentioned, and just to wrap up, um, your lab, uh, like I, I mentioned at the beginning, in my lab interviewed a bunch of founders of innovation labs in the Global South. Your lab is probably the only one, or, or the more famous one, that's been through three administrations. And very not just three administrations. Very different ones. Very different <laughs> administrations. How did you yeah. not survive, thrive? Yeah, we, we more than survived three uh, different governments with very different political views because we understood in the process that, first of all, of course, a lab is a very technical agency, but you must do also the political work at the same time. Is part of the of the work, and you have to understand this because if not, your agency, your lab, your team, in some point of the time, with a change of command, with a change of administration, can be closed. Secondly, we understood that the lab must be uh, related with big challenges of the society. Uh, and of course align with the priorities of different governments and you must be flexible on that, but you must have results because with the results, for example in Chile, Laboratorio de Gobierno, the government lab, in the last eight years had implemented more than 35 different innovations 
at a national scale in more than 10 different sectors, working with more than 167 different public institutions. So did that result show to the politicians in different moments that this agency and the lab can be useful for people and of course for political goals. And if you can connect the instant incentives of the politicians with the incentives of civil servants and with, of course, the needs of people, of citizens, well, you can not only survive with your lab, you can evolve a lot. And right now, the good news is that on Chile, Laboratorio de Gobierno is a state policy with a long-term vision, with a strong uh, team with capabilities, and also stalling, stalling a lot of capabilities with a network of more than 20,000 members, uh, a public innovators network that is working every day with civil servants and also with the ecosystem, with GovTech, with academia, with NGOs, understanding how we can do it better because this is a all day or day by day uh, evolution uh, in methodologies, in case study, in how you can share knowledge to another uh, civil servant in another part of the government. And also I would say, Carlos, that to, to end the idea, you must measure this. And that is why we developed with the Inter-American Development Bank and very unique public innovation index. I, I motivate you to learn about this because it's an index that is measuring uh, innovative capabilities of public institutions at the same time that is uh, getting uh, tools to the agencies and to the leaderships of the agencies, the authorities, to go further mm -hmm. uh, with the improvement of these capabilities that are central in the new context, not only in the emerging economies or uh, non-development countries, also in the rest of the world. And um, I'll give you the honor of the last question, and it's gonna come from the audience. Um, and they're asking, uh, what can the Global North do to support GovTech for the Global South? And vice versa. <laughs> What's that? And vice versa. And vice versa, yes. Yes. So I think that's why we're here, to learn about each other's challenges and how we can address things. I'm here to get a lot of knowledge. Like I said, I'm here with my team. It's a new space for us. Um, partnership with MIT just brought this on. So we've been doing reforms, uh, over 160 reforms over the last six years. In the business climate space, it's important because investors from all over the world want to invest in Nigeria. It's a huge market. And we also need to scale up our competitiveness and productivity. So there's a symbiosis there. and. Um, what I want to do is learn as much as possible. I've been learning from Roman already from MIT. I've met a couple of people, so knowledge is power. And I'm also happy to share how we've tackled some very wicked problems. I love and that. are still tackling them. Knowledge is power, so come talk to us afterwards. I'm yeah. sure the speakers have a lot to, to, uh, to share with you from their experiences and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Uh, for being here with us and sharing these experiences. I've been talking to these two for uh, more than a day already. Um, <laughs> so uh, it doesn't end the conversation here. I'm sure we're going to continue talking at the reception. So I welcome you all to, to come chat with us. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs>